oh Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. So today we believe that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. So we have the opportunity to respond in worship this morning, respond to God's faithfulness and goodness towards us. So let's sing. Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Come on, lift it up this morning, all my life
lift your hands with me this morning. God, we come to you in a posture of surrender today. God, I thank you for this space where we get to acknowledge your presence. God, that you're already here, that you're in this room. Father, would you help us to take a step in your direction today? God, whatever it is that we walked in here with, however we showed up, would you just remind us that you're with us? Remind us of who you are today. God, that we don't have to strive, we don't have to um, earn your love, earn forgiveness. God, you've already extended those to us. We just have to receive them. So God, I thank you for the gift of your son. I thank you for Jesus. As we prepare for Easter, would today be a reminder that God, you came, you sent your son to seek and to save the lost, to come after us, to come in our direction. So God, I thank you for that today. We praise you for that today. I thank you for who you are and that we get to respond to you in worship with praise, with our voices, our hands lifted high to you, God, thanking you for who you are. Would you remind us of who you are today and that you're with us and that your presence is in this place. We love you, we trust you, and we give you all of the glory and the honor today. I pray all of this in Jesus' holy and mighty name and all God's people said, 
Amen, amen. Hey, if you're grateful to be in the room this morning, would you put your hands together? We are so, so glad to be with you guys. My name's Lindsay. It's so great to be here with you. Hey, would you say hi to the people around you that you do not know? Tell them you're glad to see them. Shake some hands, give some high fives. We're so glad you guys are here. Hey, if you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're here and that you're a part of our church. How's everybody doing? It's spring. Yay. How's everybody's bracket doing? Anybody? Yeah, no, no. See, you're just playing right now, but anyway. Uh, see, that's amazing. Kentucky is not playing, just so you know that. <laughs> anyway, uh, hey, uh, if you have a Bible with you, uh, Matthew 22 is where we're gonna start. We're gonna be Matthew most of the day. We're gonna be all over the place, but mostly Matthew. Uh, it's so cool to watch all these heads go down and, and get your app out. Uh, before we do that, let me just say this. If you're new, all of our campuses are linked together right now. A lot of us have been coming to these big rooms for a while, and, and we're thinking, like, what's the next thing for me? And out in, your, in the lobby of all your campuses, there's this thing called Discover, and it's just a place to stop by, have a conversation going, what's next for me? What's next for us? What's available to us to take that next step? So I just encourage you, uh, whatever campus you're at, just stop out in your lobby and go like, okay, I'm, I'm ready to take another step. Next week is Easter, ta-da, right? And it's baptism weekend, which is a party, and so uh, we're looking forward to that. Let me jump into this. Um, today's gonna feel like, like he's all over the map. Like, 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 like where's he going with it? You're gonna think that more than normal, anyway, but uh, I, I promise if you will hang in there to the end, I believe, all right, and I saw it happen last night, God has something that he wants to teach you. And I know that because um, I had a sermon written for the, today and I threw it out and I sat at my kitchen table and I wrote a different one and I had to stop several times because I couldn't see my computer screen because I kept getting tears in my eyes because of how we're gonna end today. And so I, I, I just say this, I, I'm overwhelmed. Maybe it's because Easter's a week away. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude from God. I, I, the goodness of God, what we've been talking about, his goodness just keeps on chasing us, doesn't it? I'm grateful that he has saved me, and, and, and really, I hope that's the only takeaway, really, today. I want you to walk out of here, like, which I, I never thought about it. I'm just so grateful that God cared enough about me to save me and love me. I think we take that for granted, all right? And, and also a passion to keep on going, wherever God is taking you in your life or, or, the, or taking this church. And so my, again, my original intent today uh, was to teach on, uh, on, on uh, Palm Sunday and the Last Supper, because that's what this week is, uh, where Jesus, he gathers all of his, his disciples in a room and they celebrate the Jewish Passover and he gives new meaning to all those symbols uh, by, by showing them that they all point to him, all right, that, and, and what he will accomplish on the cross. Jesus will become our Passover lamb, all right? And then after eating that meal, they go out and Jesus is arrested and, and then crucified. And so I, that's what I'm gonna teach on. As I'm reading through that, all the different accounts of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I wanted to make sure I had the right context for what was going on leading up to that meal. And so as I read through each one of those Gospels, I, I backed up a few chapters and I found in every one of them a, a similar order in telling the story of Jesus' final week before that Passover meal, followed by his arrest, his trials, his crucifixion, his resurrection. And I think that's really, really important that, that, that all four of them said, whoever reads this for the next couple thousand years, they gotta get this, okay? And let me explain, I'll explain why it's so important, all right? I'm gonna use a, a metaphor, all right? I wanna talk to parents, okay? Or grandparents, I guess kids, because you have parents, so I'm talking to everybody here, all right? So, Think about a time, parents, right, when, when you were about to leave town, you're going on vacation and you weren't taking them with you or, or you're going on a business trip or whatever, leading up to that departure day, all right, you found yourself repeatedly reminding your children of several things to keep in mind while you're gone, usually connected to one or all of the following. The first thing is you would remind them, all right, here's the most important thing. Don't forget this, okay? If you don't do anything else, you gotta remember this. Like, we're a family, we love each other, remember that, okay? Take care of one another, you're the man of the house, you're whatever, right? so that's the most important thing, all right? Followed by a directive, here's what I want you to do while I'm gone, right? Like pick up your sister from soccer every day, or you have a dentist appointment on Tuesdays, there's no parties, no girls in the house, don't burn anything down, stuff like that, you know, basic, here's what I want you to do, all right? And the third thing would be a promise. I'm, I'm coming home, I will be coming home, and de depending upon what I find when I walk in the door, that will be a good day for you or, or a bad day. But it's your choice. Parents, we all have the speech, right? Right? Okay. So, so a reminder of the most important thing, followed by directives, here's what I'm telling you to do, followed by a promise that I will come home, and this is what happens if you do or do not do what I told you to do while I was gone, based on that most important thing, that we love each other, okay? 
Well, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we find these same three things repeated over and over. It's in the Gospel of John too, but, but due to who John's writing to, it's a little, little less obvious, but it is, it is there. But it's a reminder, a directive, and a promise. That's what we're gonna cover today. A reminder, a directive, and then a promise. So we're in the book of Matthew. We're gonna be there today, right? But you can, again, you can find this every place. But Jesus is being, where we pick up the story, Jesus is being questioned by religious leaders. And anytime the, 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 the religious leaders uh, question Jesus, it's not because they care what he has to say. They're hoping he'll answer it wrong, and they'll go, like, see, he's a fake. All right, so they're trying to trap him. So we're in Matthew chapter 22. Here we go, ready? And one of them, a lawyer, well, there you go, Sorry, lawyers. Anyway, but um, don't prosecute me, all right? So um, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test Jesus. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these, this is important, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus is basically asked, what's the most important, greatest commandment that we have received from God that he's telling us to do? And, and, and they're hoping Jesus, again, will answer it incorrectly, and they'll go, that's wrong, the wrong answer, he's a fake. But, but Jesus answers the question perfectly, because he's Jesus, okay? See, so he says this, the most important, the most important thing that God has told us to do is to love him. Love God with all of your, every, every part of your life, heart, soul, mind. In, in, in Mark, uh, he takes the word mind and splits it in two different words, mind and strength, all right? But Jesus doesn't stop there. Yes, for the most important one, he throws this in. And there is a second commandment that is like it. Literally, it translates, connected to it, like unto it. They cannot be separated. They're, they're all one commandment, and it's this. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Right? Now, now get this, Jesus says that any and everything else that you might read in this entire Bible foundationally falls apart if you don't pay attention to those, if you don't practice those two connected, inseparable commandments. Love God with every part of your life and love her and him and the people around you like you love yourself. The whole Bible rests on it. The other place that Jesus uses that the whole Bible rests on this one thing is found in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. It's what we now call the famous golden rule. This is where it came from, right? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, and here it is, for this is the law and the prophets. So here, loving your neighbor the way that you love yourself is defined this way, then treat your neighbor in the same way that you wish your neighbor would treat you. And for us who are, say, I'm a follower of Jesus, it would expand and it would include this. Treat the people around you in the same way that God has treated you and extend to them what God has extended to you. And again, Jesus says that sums up the whole Bible, and if you don't do that, the Bible loses its foundation. You can do everything else in the Bible, but if you don't do that, you've kind of missed it. In another place, Jesus says it this way. Uh, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Now, love one another is not a new commandment. It's all over the Bible, right? That's been around a long time, but Jesus adds this. Just as, or in the same way that I have loved you, love her, love them, love one another. That's the new part that people had never you know, done the math and said, oh, I think I know what he wants me to do. Later, John, who's one of Jesus' best friends, he drives home what he learned from Jesus when he comments and writes down to us what happens when we don't do that. He says this, he says, if anyone says, I love God, and if I just took a, a hand check right now, like, anybody love God? We all go, yeah, I love, I love God. Okay, great, good for you, all right. Anyone who says, I love God, and hates his brother is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. So John just cuts to the chase and goes, oh, you claim to love God but refuse to love your neighbor? I'm gonna call it out. You're a liar about what? About loving God. You follow me? That's heavy, right? In order for loving God to be a true statement about your life, you must also love the people around you. It's never one or the other. I'm good with God, I hate her. It can't be, right? Now you find a version of this great most important commandment in every one of the gospels and it's all happening in the days, just a few days, a week leading up to Jesus being crucified, resurrected, and returning to his father for like 2,000 years and counting. So let's go back to the parent metaphor of a parent about to leave on a trip. I think this qualifies as the most important thing. The reminder of the most important thing, and here it is, we are commanded to love God and to love one another. Most important thing, okay? 
Now after this, if you're to read all the rest of Matthew and the, all, all the gospel, right? Jesus begins to tell a string of stories, they're called parables, earthly stories about stuff here on earth, but they really illustrate a spiritual truth of what life in his kingdom is gonna look like and what he wants us to be doing, his directives, while he is gone. And, th and that's where we're gonna land in just a few minutes. But I'm gonna skip over the second thing and I wanna go to the third thing, I wanna go to the promise. So we, ha we have the most important thing, and then we have a promise, because in almost every story and illustration that Jesus gives for the rest, right up to his, uh, uh, that, that meal that he has with his disciples, all right, um, either at the beginning of it uh, or at the end of that illustration, Jesus gives them a promise. And it's meant to give them hope. It's meant to give us hope, but it also serves as a warning. And here it is. Jesus says several times, so I'm going to leave, I'm gonna return to my Father, but I promise I will return. And I will hold everyone accountable for what they have done based on the directives that I gave them. In the next few chapters, then Jesus goes on. Read this, it's really heavy reading, all right? Jesus gives some really harsh warnings. They're called woes, like woe to you, to the, the, the religious leaders who have abused people. Then he walks out of the temple, he stops his disciples, turns around, because they're impressed with that. And he, he points at the building, going, the whole thing's falling down. And 40 years after, 40 after the, years after this moment, they, they tear it down. And then Jesus begins to teach about how crazy the world is gonna get right before his second coming, when he comes back. In the time leading up to, to his return, all right? So he's described, we're in this time because he hasn't returned yet. He tells him this, listen, look for this. A false Christ, an antichrist, several, several false messiahs, they'll show up and they will lead people astray. They'll lead Christians astray. There'll be wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise up against nation. There'll be famines, there'll be economic collapse. And during this time, followers of Jesus, that'd be us, will be hated. Eventually a time will come when we will be put to death and, and we will turn away from Jesus to save our own skins. But Jesus says this, but the gospel will be pro proclaimed to every corner of the earth. And then I'll come back. Then he says this in every one of these stories. And if you don't believe me, read them later today, all right? He says some version of this. Therefore, if all that's true, you, now he's talking to us, also must be ready for the Son of Man, Jesus, is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then Jesus tells a bunch more stories describing us how we need to be living our lives until he returns. And living them, um, the, the, the word would be uh, imminent return. Like it could happen at any moment. Jesus could come back at any moment. There's nothing, there's no temple that needs to be built. There's nothing that has to happen in Israel or, or there, or what, all these things that they were talking. He could come back at any minute and, and he's gonna say one of two things to us. He's gonna say, well done, good and faithful servant, all right, come, come, come in my direction, or he's gonna say, you wicked, slothful servant, I never knew you, and then you get cast out. Now, why is Jesus talking about his second coming when his first coming isn't over yet, right? And the answer is not, he's threatening us. Because I've always read this, I've always been terrified of the second coming, like, like, like he said, hey, I'm coming back, and if you don't behave, I'll send you to hell, right? That's not really consistent with Jesus. Right? Like, it's not consistent with um, we're saved by grace, right? And not by what we do and what we don't do. I, I live most of my Christian life thinking if I screwed up, I bet I'm going back to hell. Like Jesus made a mistake with me. I, I really, really thought that. But, but that's, that's not true about grace. So, so he's not threatening us with the second coming. He's actually doing the opposite by giving them this promise. I am coming back. And the promise is, so hold on. Hope. So let's go back to the three things Jesus wants his followers to remember before they head into Jerusalem and he is arrested and crucified. First thing is this, this is all kind of review. Reminder, the most important commandment from Jesus is to love God with everything, which is directly connected to loving people. Everybody follow that? He says, oh, that's, that's the most important thing. I'm gonna be gone for, like, I know, 2,000 years and counting. Don't forget that. Jesus then goes on and makes it, gives a description of a time is coming when life's gonna get really, really tough for you, all right? Really hard for followers of Jesus. They will be treated like enemies. They will be hated by so many people, by, by culture. They, they will we'll lose our rights. Some, some of us will lose our possessions. Some of us will lose our life. And Jesus says that it will get so bad that if Jesus doesn't come back and step in, none of us survive. The elect don't survive. So in that, in, in, if, if, with that kind of scene in mind, Jesus gives them a promise to hold on to, gives us a promise to hold on to when your life gets really hard and you're tempted to go, I can't do this anymore. He's saying, don't give up, why? Because, and here's the promise, I will return. I will reward and bless those who endure to the end. So hold on, and I will punish those who fall away. So we have a reminder of the most important thing and a promise that he will return, but let's go to that number two, right? Like, like what does he want us to do? Like, what is the directive? How does Jesus command us, 
all right? Direct us to live our lives between this current moment in 2024 and the moment that he returns, five minutes from now or 50 years from now, especially when life gets hard. What is he telling us to do in the meantime that he will be looking for and he will reward or he will punish? And that directive is found in all those stories that he tells in these chapters, but especially in a really famous parable that compares the second coming of Jesus to a shepherd separating sheep from goats. It's in Matthew 25, if you wanna read along. It's a long, it's a long passage. It's like a, half a page in the Bible, and I'm gonna read it all, okay? And then we're gonna unpack it together. So Matthew 25, this, I love this story. Okay, so. When the Son of Man, that's Jesus, comes in his glory, second coming, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, the sheep, will answer saying, Lord, like, when did that happen? <laughs> when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, let's just say this last part together, one, two, three. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to, what's the last word? You did it to me. What you did to them, you did for me. Then he turns to his left. And he says to them, these are the goats, <laughs> depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And they ask the same question. So they're like, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and didn't you know, take care of you, minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to, what's the word? Me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So what is the directive that Jesus has given us to live out in this life from now, this moment on, until he returns, living with the full expectation that he will keep his promise and he could return in the next blink of an eye, right? And here it is. I want my people, I want you to live your life loving God with your entire heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we look back and go, how are we gonna do that? And he says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. Okay, how do we do that? What does that look like? What is the directive? And here it is. Treat or do for others the way Jesus has treated you. That's, that's what that sums it up. Well, how are we supposed to be living our lives? We're supposed to treat other people in the similar way that Jesus has treated us. And then he says this, and when you do that, or when you refuse to do that, Jesus says, I take it personally. I consider that as the same thing as you doing it to me or, or refusing to do it for me. Well, what does that look like in our life? What, what does it look, let's look at that list that Jesus gives of directives. So go back to, the, to Matthew 25. All these things, and if you look at them, all these things he has done for us and now he tells us to do for someone else. Let's look at the first one. First, he says this, I was hungry and you gave me food, thirsty and you gave me drink. And that, you know, that could be like, hey, every year we do a big food drive, so it could be that. But I think it's deeper than that. So I want you to look at your own life in these next few minutes, okay? There was a time, you might be in it right now, but there was a time when you were hungry and thirsty in some part of your life, it wasn't fulfilled and you were, you were looking for it, and you thought it could be satisfied if you just did something, or achieved something, or married someone, or dated somebody, or, or achieved something in this world, and how many years did you spend chasing it? But all it did was leave you more empty and dissatisfied. But here's a lot of our stories. But a day came when you found out that there are some things that only Jesus can satisfy. Now, you, you, you've realized that. I'll bet there's some, you know somebody in your life. I'm gonna pray for the rest of this, this, this message, right, that God brings somebody into your, into your mind, okay? You know somebody in your life, a friend, a family member, and you know they're chasing the wrong dream. It's just obvious to you. They're chasing the wrong thing, and they're looking for something that could actually make them happy and satisfied forever. So you're not the Holy Spirit, you're not Jesus, you're not a savior, but what could you do for that person that you go like, they are hungry and thirsty for something? How could I help them find true meaning like I found in Jesus? I don't know, think about it. 
How about this? I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. Again, let's look at our stories. There was a day when you and I, we were cut off from God because of our sin. And Jesus, Jesus never wrote us off. He never treated us like a stranger. In my case, he came looking for me. We just sang that song, right? And, and, and welcome us to be with him. And so ask God right now, right? Uh, it's gonna be very practical the rest of this, this talk, all right? Is there somebody in your life coming into mind right now who thinks Jesus is a stranger, maybe he's an enemy, and it's probably because of some church hurt or some Christians hurt, hurt him, all right? Is there, is there anything that Jesus could tell you to do to invite them to come closer and see who you've actually discovered Jesus really is? And he's not like their church that beat him up. I don't know. How about this? I was, I was naked and you clothed me. And that could be literally, let's do a food or a clothing drive or something like that. That's a good thing. Um, but, but nakedness in the Bible means more. In the Bible, it usually refers to people who are, are living in shame and fear and insecurity. Think Adam and Eve in the garden when they got busted. What's the first thing they did? They, t- they tried to cover up their nakedness. They, they hid in fear from God, and God came looking for them. He's, he's calling out in the garden, Adam, Eve, where are you? Question, did, Adam and Eve, did God know where Adam and Eve were? Yeah, it's like, I know you're behind the bushes. It's like your three-year-old playing hide and seek. I'm not behind the curtain. Yes, you are, all right, so. It's like, you know, he was looking for them because he was inviting them to come back to him. He could have just smashed them, you know, yep, right, right? But come back, and then God covered their nakedness and their shame, and then later, Jesus, his son, paid for their sin. Think about it. there's someone in your life right now who's living in shame because their sin, their failure, uh, their embarrassing mistakes have been, been discovered, and now they're running from God and hiding from you. Remember, please remember this, all right, church, all right? Every one of us, we used to have the same naked shame problem. And Jesus found you, picked you up, took away your shame, and, and as scripture says, he covered you in his own robe of righteousness. And again, we're nobody's savior. But what is one thing that God is telling you to do right now for a person that's coming into your mind right now that might be a step towards discovering that, here, here's next week, God does not hate you. No matter what you've done, God, is, God doesn't hate you for what you're ashamed of. How about that? He loves them and he wants to rescue them from guilt and shame and give them something better. Again, you're not Jesus, but what could you do for them that demonstrates a picture of what Jesus has done for you? Here's the takeaway. Go do that. I, I was sick and you visited me. I, 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 I don't, if you're sick, I don't, I don't like to be around sick people. Was, anyway, all right, so here's why, all right? Um, because sickness always has some like, nasty smell or behavior, and sometimes you're contagious, all right? And so it's like, I don't want you around, but that, that pretty much reminds me of, it reminds me of me when Jesus found me. Because I know the moment. Do you remember your moment? I remember the wallpaper on the wall. I remember it, it was filthy. It was, I was a mess. And he came in my direction, and my sickness and my brokenness didn't make him sick or break him. His love and grace and wholeness actually healed my sick soul. And the way he did it, see, I, I, I'm not that preacher who goes, God spoke to me. God's never spoken to me. I've never had an angel in my room. I've never had a, ah, oh, I never left my body. I'm not, I, if you have, I don't believe you, but that's all right. So uh, <laughs> God, God, God hasn't ever appeared to me, all right? I mean, I have his word. He did it through people in my life who refused to give up on me. Uh, the first two that come to memory is my roommate in college and my girlfriend, who's been my wife now for almost 40 years, all right? They never gave up on me, ready for this? While I was still sick, before I stopped being sick or got better, or I, they, they, they never gave up on me while I was still acting sick. Sick people act sick, ta-da, all right, right? Do you know somebody in your life that everybody has given up on? And if you were them sitting in their house right now, what would you hope, I mean, you probably wouldn't even have this hope, but what would blow your mind that somebody would do for you? Go do that. Go do that. This is very practical, right? And, and, you're, and I think the Holy Spirit's bringing somebody to your name. How about this one? I was in prison and you came to me. You know, there's all kinds of prisons, aren't there? Uh, addiction, that's a prison. Someone's been locked up in that. Depression feels like a prison, doesn't it? A grave. Debt feels like a prison. Loneliness feels like a prison. Guilt for our past feels like a prison. Anger, bitterness, heartbreak, all feel like prisons. And here's what I know about prison. When you're in prison, it's like isolation. I am, you're, you're alone, and eventually you just give up on the idea of ever being free again, of anything getting better. But, but let's be honest, okay? I'm, I think I'm talking to most people, all right? 
Look at your own story. For a lot of us, think about your lowest, darkest prison moment is the moment in desperation where you called out to Jesus. You hadn't paid attention to him for years and then you got locked up in something and you started paying attention to Jesus, calling on Jesus, and when you did that, he came and visited you. He came in your direction, remember that? Like he's right here. As a matter of fact, looking back, we now see, I can see, that Jesus was right there in that prison cell with me. Sitting there with me, I just didn't notice him. And he's the reason I'm free today. What would that look like for you to go visit a person who's imprisoned by their past or present struggles in this life and show them that Jesus is the key to freedom and healing like you have found? Here's the application. Then go do that. And why is Jesus telling us to live this way? And the answer is because when you do that for somebody else, even the, the person you're going, I could, they'll say no, the least of these. Let's put them in a category, right? Jesus says, if, if you blow them off or if you, if, you, if you try, I take it personally as if you were doing it for me and when you blow them off, I take that personally too because that's me too. Now, I said I'm gonna be all over the map so hold on to all that and uh, we're gonna take a turn, okay? I love this church. I, I, love, I have loved this church the heart of this church since Robin and I flew out from Kentucky in 2005 and visited it. I remember we were in the Jack store. It's now a Jack store. It wasn't then, it was the church. But anyway, Robin and I walked in the lobby and it was not fancy. If any of you were there, it was like, there was, it stunk. It was just, it was a mess. Anyway, but anyway, but we walked into Flatirons and we sat through that first service and I remember looking at Robin and going like, can you feel something like, like a palpable buzz, right? Like, like, like we can feel like God's here. Like, like God's doing something. And we were surrounded by people that back in, most, most churches back east, they would not have allowed these people in their door. I mean, I mean it, it, was, it was, the first, the first funeral I ever did at Flatirons, there was a lady in the back row with a snake, a real one around her. I'm like, what's happening here, right? So anyway, so, but I remember Robin and I saying, we got back to the hotel and, and we looked at each other and said, hey, even if they don't hire us, we should move here to be a part of a church like this. A church that cares about lost and broken people in a lost and broken world, or as Jesus would call them, call us the least of these. A church that cares about the least of these. And the reason I still love this church today is not because, listen, we are not a perfect church. You can find flaws all over this place. And most of you email me when you find one. Thank you, right? But <laughs> no, the reason I, I love this church is because the most important thing, the main thing hasn't changed. We refuse to separate loving God from loving people. Even messy, sick, hungry, imprisoned, naked, ashamed, broken people. We are the, why do you care about, why are you friends with those kind of people, kind of church? And we will be that until they fire me, all right? Now, I wanna give you two stories about what that looks like. When, and then I'm gonna give you a challenge, something to consider in the next five days, six days before, before Easter. First, I wanna share with you a video that, that I received, and Amanda, who uh, runs our missions team, and really you all received, that's what I'm passing on to you, from one of our mission partners called One Child, right after they received a gift from Flatirons for $500,000 from our Christmas offering to combat sex trafficking in the Philippines. Now, I've watched this thing at least 10 times, so I'm just warning you, and I'm talking to the dudes too, you might wanna get a Kleenex, <laughs> a tissue, because I have not made it through without, without crying. Because here's the thing, this is what it looks like. When Jesus said, you rescue and visit the least of these and you rescue them from prison, this is what it looks like. I am so profoundly grateful. Um, I don't have words, I'm not gonna be able to convey this, but I just want you to know that it matters. The impact that that gift is gonna have is huge. Uh, for this, this guy right here, it's very, very personal. Uh, you know, I've been uh, around the world 20 years of working with kids at risk have seen all kinds of hard things but this specific program in the philippines that's helping girls rescuing them out of exploitation in such uh, horrific conditions it's um it's very dear to my heart bethany and i my wife and i we we were there about seven years ago and we met one of those little girls who had just been rescued and she was seven years old and she uh, had been brought out of one of those circumstances that's just unspeakable. But she was completely traumatized and withdrawn and she was sick and had um, so many challenges physically and no attachment. She would not speak a word to anybody. And you know, you're in a fight for all these kids and sometimes it's just one kid for whatever reason that God just um, puts on your heart and so Bethany and I began supporting her 
and the Philippines Child Rescue Program, that, that very unique One Child Hope Center. Over the years, and we began watching how this girl, surrounded by loving child champions and, and friends and safe place to play and all of the things that happened there, was just, was just blooming was just beginning to really uh, grow. And I remember one of the first pictures that we got, she had done this little artwork and taken torn up pieces of yellow scrap paper and pasted them together to make a smiley face. But surrounding this smiley face was this simple message, God loves me. And that's what it's all about. It's all about someone who has been through unspeakable experiences beginning to believe that that's true, that God loves me. That is the heart of hope. That's the foundation. That's the place where it's born, to believe that. And the, somehow the way she had taken those torn up pieces and pasted it back together, it just it was like a message to me of this, this, is, this is how hope gets made. It gets made out of the torn up pieces of our life, pasted back together into this condition of joy. And so watching her grow over the years and then... Uh, a few years later, she made the decision to get baptized. So the belief that God loves me, turning into a commitment that, that she's going to give her life to follow Jesus. And seeing her out there in the water, surrounded by her friends and demonstrating that commitment was another milestone moment. Bethany and I just cried for joy at seeing that. And then not long after that, this little girl who came in unwilling to speak to anybody had her graduation moment and stood up in front of all these other kids and shared, and so I want you to just see this and, and, and hear her voice. Standing here in front of you to express my gratitude to God for helping me in my studies to all the people in AHER who, who supported me in this journey. Thank you and God bless us all. I'm telling you, it, it's, it's one thing to talk about it. It's one thing to, you know, believe that this is true, that God is a redeemer, that God is at work doing restoration and that, that hopeless situations can be transformed. That which was intended for evil can be turned for good. It's, it's easy to say all those things, but when you see it in real life and you see kids who've gone through that believing and growing now to become who God intended them to be, man, it just, it just changes things. It makes it all so worthwhile and it helps us all get perspective. I mean, all of us have challenges. All of us are facing hard things, but to see the faith lived out in the lives of, of kids like this. Um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for your yes. I remember being there in your office and how you guys were asking questions and kind of challenging things and it was, which is absolutely appropriate and great, but you decided to say yes. That yes is transforming lives. That yes, I mean, she's just one girl, but there's 60 other girls. That's an expensive program. You know, it's got full-time teachers and nurses and social workers, and it's not easy to, to run that program. And so we're always trying to raise money. And to be honest, we've been falling short. And so we've been subsidizing it from our reserves and we're, we run lean. We're, we're not here to raise money and just sit on it. We're here to move money out to bless those kids. and. And so there was a lot of pressure to reduce those grants. And your gift, the gift from Flatirons Church transformed that, just completely changed it. Your gift is going to support this program for an entire year. Thank you for your yes and for your partnership with One Child. And it's, you know, every Hope Center is unique. We have 350 Hope Centers all around the world. Each one is unique. Each one is a local group of believers trying to do their best to help kids at risk in their community. And your partnership with us is strengthening those programs and reaching over a thousand kids now. Every story matters. Every one of those kids needs to know they are loved by God and they will experience that. Not just hear about it, not just read about it, but experience it in relationship with child champions. Somewhere that child who sponsored as a coach, a youth pastor, a mentor, a teacher, somebody who knows them by name and knows how they're doing and knows when to encourage them, when to challenge them, how to help them overcome the adversity in their lives. 
and to really experience the love of God in that way that transforms them to grow up to be who God designed them to be. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Flatirons Church, for your faithfulness, for your generosity, and for caring about these kids and standing in the gap for them it is incredibly important. You know, we shared the news of your gift uh, with the, the team there in the Philippines who's working with those girls, and they wanted to express their gratitude as well. So uh, I hope that as you hear their words of thanksgiving, you'll hear it in the voice of Jesus. Thank you, Pastor Jim and Flat Irons Church. We are John and Kelly Wilford, the directors of PCRH, Philippine Child Rescue Home, here in Cebu, Philippines. Since 1994, PCRH, or locally called Happy Horizons, has been a home for children rescued from trafficking and exploitation here in the Philippines. Recovery from the trauma of sexual abuse is a long and difficult process, but little by little and day by day, we do see healing and growth in these children. PCRH is all about collaboration. We have a team of teachers, social workers, nurses, and caregivers that make sure our kids feel safe every day. And your gift enables us to continue on with that care. And because of your big heart for our kids and our staff, you are able to provide healthy and nutritious meals for our kids. And also you were able to help us with the medical thing in our kids here. Just like today, uh, you were able to send one kid to the doctor because of her sickness. Through that, we are able to attend fellowship and trainings, and we have an easy access of transportation. It allows us to travel safely during court hearings, and it also provides good meal for the kids to let them stay calm during court hearings, and it also allows me to be their social worker. So we will be able to help the students, especially those who are struggling with their lessons. They'll be able to watch and they, they'll be able to have a clear visual aid about their lessons. And that's a big help for them and for me as well as a teacher. Music is one of the greatest soundtrack here in Happy Horizons where the children express their talents through singing and playing instruments. And because of your help, we are able to provide the instruments that they need. Thank you very much, and once again, God bless you. Thank you so much for this amazing, amazing gift to the kids at PCRH. Yes, thank you, Flat Irons Church. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Thank you for providing hope in hard places. Dear God, we ask you to bless and protect Pastor Jim and his family. And we pray that Pastor Jim would be bold in following God. We thank you, God, for Pastor Amanda's life and ask that you would bless her. We thank you, God, for helping Pastor Amanda be a champion for children. We ask to bless Black Aaron's Church. Thank you, God, for partnership between Black Aaron's Church and One Child. Mm. Um, so if you're wondering, like, am I making a difference in the world? Um, all, all the parents or grandparents have daughters. Will you raise your hand? Because this is what, this is, this is somebody's daughter or granddaughter. And here's what made me just lose it the first time I watched this is that picture. Because when I got it, we didn't blur out her face for security. I was I'm looking at it. And she's the same age as two of my granddaughters. And it got real. It's like, it's the worst thing happened to my, my family. Would somebody come looking for us? The answer is yeah. Yeah. Um, I gotta, you gotta keep going. All right, so one more story. Um, so I'm driving to work a, a few weeks ago, and most of the time I love windshield time. It takes me like 35 minutes to drive from my house to my office, but uh, this day as I'm driving to work, I'm, I'm just not in a good place. And when I say that, I realize I said that last month and the month before, so pray for me. Anyway, but... <laughs> But anyway, I, I, I'm driving, and maybe you can identify this, I'm making a list of everything that's wrong in my life. 
Like my truck literally got hit by a Mack truck in January, right? And it's still being repaired, all right? So, and I have this one person on staff that's really, I, I didn't, did I say on staff? I didn't mean to, I have this one person in my life um, uh, that's really on my nerves and I'm rehearsing imaginary conversations that I'm gonna have to have with this guy and then, and then there's another uh, relationship and it's not doing well and I don't know how to fix that, all right? And by the time I get to my office, I'm having quite the pity party, all right? Like super negative, glass half empty. Anybody remember Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh? It's probably gonna rain. That, I, that was it, okay? So my life is hard. It's that kind of day. Has anybody else had one of those days I'm not the only sinner in the room. Okay, good. And so, so, so anyway, um, I, I go in my office uh, and, uh, and, and I go in and I sit down and I remember some other things that are wrong so I start spiraling a little bit more and then my phone dings, okay? And I see I've gotten a text uh, from Clay and Clay uh, leads uh, our mission partner, AIM, uh, Agape International Mission in Cambodia and we had just sent them $500,000 from our Christmas offering to, again, to, to combat sex trafficking, to buy them a SWAT vehicle so that they can actually go and raid brothels and rescue women and children who are being trafficked and expand the recovery program for the, those girls who have come out. I, I, I love this. Uh, in June, we're sending a team of men and women from Flatirons who are in law enforcement over to Cambodia to train their SWAT team, all right, uh, on police tactics. That's the best mission trip of all time. Anyway, so, and I, I can't even tell you the other things they're gonna do because I, it breaks international law. Anyway, so anyway, so, so I'm sitting in my office and my phone dings and, and here's what Clay texts me. It'll be on the screen too, right? Just successfully raided the two massage brothels, 10 rescued, most of whom we suspect are minors with two suspects arrested. We'll update more tomorrow when we confirm identities and ages. Still processing the scene just now. None of this would be happening without flat irons. Then he sends me another one. Hey Jim, just an update from the team. Eight of those rescued are confirmed children. So four went to ARH Rescue Center and four went to ARH Overflow while, uh, Rescue Center while we are moving into the new building. So the two adults were transferred to a shelter in Batambang, which was the location of the raid. Both suspects who were running the brothels should be going to court tomorrow or Friday blessings, and I thought, that's it, and then he sends me this one. Lastly, I wanted to send you a picture of where in faith this is all heading for these, girl, these eight rescued girls in our care. Last week, we got to baptize 34 girls in our rescue home and celebrate their public declaration of faith. These eight girls are experiencing right now a princess party tonight. Uh, learning that the king of the universe created them and that means that they are a princess. They'll spend the next year and a half getting holistically cared for and we hope that in that process they would experience the love of Jesus and put their faith in him. Now you can clap for that. That's um. So I'm sitting in my office and my first thought was, okay, my life's not that bad. <laughs> like everything kind of comes back into perspective, right? And then I was praying, thank you God for saving these children from the gates of hell. They have a hope and a future. But here's where my mind went next, why? Why did these girls get rescued and why now? Right? What about the brothel? Because that whole section of town is brothels. What about the brothel down the street where there are more little girls enduring the same horror? Remember back at Christmas we prayed, we prayed that those little girls over there would know help is on the way. Remember that? And there's some still waiting, all right? Why did these eight girls get saved and the kids down the street didn't? And after a lot of prayer, here's where I landed. I don't know. The best I can answer is this. Although AIM, the staff knew about them and they were within reach, the only reason they didn't get rescued in October or in September was it cost around $20,000 to line up all the resources to pull off that kind of raid and AIM didn't have $20,000 to do it until this past December when God moved in your hearts, the people of Flatirons, and you gave so generously and here's the message. Go rescue those girls and they did. We did. Please hear this, all right? This is gonna make, I'm gonna pop some Jesus bubbles right now. I don't care, all right? There's a phrase in Christian world that I hate. God showed up. I know what you mean by that. God didn't show up. God was already there, right? He was already there. Let me say it a different way, all right? We're not waiting on God to show up and do something. God is waiting for his people to show up and do something by joining him in his plan to rescue and save. And Flatterns, you did it. You showed up, and right now, look, right now, because you love God by loving these little girls, by rearranging your finances to rescue the least of these from the hellish prison they were trapped in. Right now, eight little girls believe that God is their father 
and that he loves them, and they, they actually have tiaras put on their head. When, when they come into that, that rescue center, they put them on, they tell me you're a princess, and the girls look back. They're not even responsive. They, they don't even have a category for it, but by the time they leave that program, they have another party where they put the princess tiaras on them, and they actually accept their value because their father is the king of kings. And because of your love for God and your partnership with God through your ongoing generosity, all right, we're not done. The least of those who are still trapped on that street, right now as we speak, AIM is organizing the next raid to go back and rescue and save the children down the street who are still being trafficked. And we will, it flatters if we'll keep going, we'll rescue every one of them because they're the least of these and God loves them. That's the best answer I can come up with. Why did, why did those girls get saved? Because you all loved God by loving these little, least of these girls. And this side of heaven, you probably won't get to meet him, but can you imagine the day when you do? Right? And you saw just a glimpse of, their, their hearts are full of gratitude, and many of them will come, many of the workers at AIM and, and, at, and at One Child, they are rescued girls who came back to rescue girls, because that's what we do. So I'm thinking about all this, and then here's my follow-up question I wanna leave you with, and we'll get out of here, right? Why did God save you and me? And not our dad, or our friend, or the family across the street? Why did, why did, why did God save you? And here's my answer, ready? I don't know. But my response is twofold. Overwhelming gratitude, that's where I started today. Over, I'm just, oh God, gratitude and worship followed by, God, how can I play a part in doing for others what God, what you have done for me through Jesus? How can I get what I have been given so much? Haven't we been given so much? What do you mean? Grace, forgiveness, rescue, hope, and a future. How could God use me or you, right, to take what we have been given and give it to somebody else to do for someone else what God has done for us? Why'd you get saved? It's more than, because I didn't want to go to hell. Listen, let me talk to the Christians in the room, okay, or, or on all our campuses, right? Jesus said that nobody comes to the Father. Nobody believes Jesus is Lord and Savior unless God the Father does something in that person, draws that person to himself. So if you say, I'm saved, you're saved because God drew you to himself and you met Jesus and you put your faith and trust in him. Why did he do that for you and not the person down the street who's still hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and in prison? And again, I don't know. I know this. If you're saved, then accept that, with salva that salvation with gratitude and worship. We're not waiting for God to show up and do something to save somebody else. Here's the picture I have in my, in, my, in my mind, all right? God is waiting on you to join him and offer to them what has been offered to you. Maybe, maybe, maybe God is doing, well, the person you've been thinking about all, all morning, all right? God is doing something in their life and you know nothing about. You, if you had to bet on it, you'd say, there's just no way, right? God is doing something in his or her life, that couple's life, that family's life, and, and, he, and he's doing something. And you know what he's probably doing right now? He's looking over his shoulder going, Come on, where are you? Partner up with me. Our role in anybody else's salvation is just show up. And do what? Feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, offer clothing to the naked and the ashamed, visit the sick, the one trapped in some prison, invite the stranger to come and meet someone who loves them so much that he would die for them. And then he rose again. Go and do for somebody else this week, somebody that you're thinking about right now. This is a picture of what God has done for you. Now, again, next week's Easter, listen, I'm just gonna put this out here, right? Uh, if you're, again, if you're a gambling person, you wanna put your money on when they're most likely to say yes, it's Easter. I don't even believe in Jesus, but I think you're supposed to go to church on Easter, I don't, right? Uh, don't say, Ben said this, don't say no for them. So do, you, do somebody come into mind, right? Listen, I know, I know what I'm teaching on it. Listen, I, I don't, I'm not trying to get a big crowd for Easter. We're gonna have a big crowd. It's gonna be nuts, okay? I'm not looking for more, I want the right people, the right people to in a room, because I know what I'm preaching on next week, and here it is. There are no lost causes with Jesus. There's no one beyond reach. There's no one who's done something that's bigger than Jesus is willing to forgive. Jesus loves and cares and saves lost causes, like me. So here's how we're gonna end this, all right? Um, we'll, we'll start singing again in, after Easter, right? Uh, but, um, Rather than, I'm gonna pray, and then I'm gonna say amen, and at all our campuses, I'm gonna ask you to do something, and you don't have to do this, all right, um, but you'll look really weird if you don't. So, uh, before you get up, would you spend 30 seconds, and, 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 and Aaron's gonna keep on playing, I call it tinkle music. <laughs> He's very well hydrated. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> will you just ask God to give you some clarity about who that is, 
don't say no for them, don't, don't rehearse the entire, they're gonna say this to me, they're gonna tell me, to, you know, pound sand, whatever that is, already. Not, not your deal. Is there somebody that's lost or broken or in prison or addicted or everybody's given up on them and you're going like, hey, I just wanna get you in a room. I'll give you another, hey, when, when church is over at all your campuses, you got a chair up here with a tiara on it, all of our campuses are right, get your phone out, come up here, up the front, take a picture of that, and at lunch, this is your lead for coming to Easter. My church is different, I'm sorry that your church beat the crap out of you. My church does this, rescues little girls, seven-year-old girls. That's what we spend our money on. And, and they'll go, well, my last church didn't do that, no. Maybe Jesus is different than your last church, right? I'm gonna pray. We just take a few seconds to go, God, give me clarity and a kind of a strategy and then go do it. So God, in this moment, I just. Um, I, uh, I thank you that you're a God who saves lost and broken little girls in the Philippines and Cambodia and a screwed up kid in college in Tennessee. <laughs> Thank you, you reach into prison cells and into addiction and into shame and guilt and, and, and say, okay, we'll start there and then a journey begins and that's my story and that's a lot of our stories. I think Amazing Grace is the best song ever because I really was once lost but now I'm found. I was blind and now I see, I, it's true. And so God, what's our response to that? We can't pay you back. We can't earn it or prove to you that we're worth saving them. Our response is just to, to worship you in gratitude. Say thank you. And if you can use me in any way, God, just make that clear to me right now. And it's, if it's making that call to my dad and, or it's my friend or walking across you know, the lunchroom or whatever and going, hey, uh, I know you're not really into the God thing, but I, I, I've one, I'll ask you one time and I won't ask you again, but... Would, would you wanna check something out? And God, I pray that you would bless those conversations, protect those conversations, and really, our responsibility is not their response. Our responsibility is just, to, in, in gratitude, we just are, are faithful. I look forward to um, telling story after story after story about another lost and broken seven-year-old who got pulled out of hell, introduced to her new heavenly father, and now she's just this beautiful woman of God. I'll never get tired of that. Thank you for saving us, loving us, not giving up on us, and it is our honor to serve you. In Jesus' wonderful name I pray, amen. Amen? Amen, all right.